All right, welcome everybody. Uh, we are Board Game Academics, and we're going to be talking today about how to level up your tabletop teach. So how to overcome all those hurdles and barriers that get in the way of teaching board games, whether it's to friends, family, students, strangers at the mall, wherever you happen to be. <laughs> um, so before we get going, a little bit about us. Uh, my name's Anthony uh, Chatfield. I uh, have been part of Board Gamers Anonymous, the podcast that we run for almost 11 years now um, with, with Chris here. Mm -hmm. um, I also am a uh, instructor at Drexel University and I use board games in my classroom. Um, and we uh, recently launched a board game journal um, that I'm the editor of. So that launched in early March. So I've been using board games, teaching board games for almost 15 years in a lot of different capacities. Hi everybody, my name is Christopher Carbone. I'm the co-host for Board Gamers Anonymous, where we try to bring more people to board gaming and introduce them to new games they may have never heard of, new techniques, new challenges, new designers. And I've been able to do this with a lot of different populations, from pre-K all the way up to high school, graduate school, colleges and universities throughout. And it's all about introducing them to great games that they can use to benefit themselves educationally, personally, even psychologically. And working with Anthony and Will on Board Gamer Academics, obviously, as we said, bringing current cutting edge research to the public about practitioners and researchers and what they're doing to help involve more people into tabletop gaming. And I'm Will Nation. Uh, I am uh, by trade a psychologist, so I work at Johns Hopkins University. Um, I'm on the podcast occasionally. I help with the academic stuff as well. Um, usually I'm involved when we're talking a lot about RPG kind of stuff. Um, in my work, I actually run therapeutic groups and individual therapy interventions for folks to use games and RPGs especially to uh, work through psychological stuff that's going on from mm -hmm. them. So I'll bring some of that uh, aspect here. But yeah, very used to teaching very complicated games to people that have no experience with them. Yeah. All right. So what are we talking about? Um, we're talking about how to teach people how to play a game, right? And so the, the big challenge that we have going into this is, you know, it's game night, you got a brand new game, you're excited to get it played, but you got to teach it, right? So we all, some of us are enjoy that, some of us don't, some of us get stuck doing it every time, this guy. <laughs> um, but it's, it's a matter of like how you're going to do it. And it, it, there's a lot of factors that go into that and we kind of want to break it down. Right, because I feel like a lot of the discourse around teaching games is how to make the rules accessible or which games are easy to teach. And we want to talk about how to kind of deconstruct that a little bit for your own purposes. All right, so throughout the presentation, we're going to use Seven Wonders as an example, as a game that a lot of people know, but is like weirdly difficult to teach to people who are very new to the experience and have never played a drafting game, or even if they have, Seven Wonders for whatever reason, despite having three or four pages of rules, gets in people's heads in a weird way. Um, and it's one that I think all of us have had experience with kind of breaking down and simplifying. Um, so we can kind of apply what we're talking about to something more concrete. Um, and Will's also gonna help us out and talk about how this all applies to tabletop RPGs, um, his expertise. Mm -hmm. All right, so the main concept here, the, the kind of the starting point, and this kind of goes to our experience dealing with um, students uh, and, and patients is this idea of backward teaching. So not necessarily like how does the game work, but where are we trying to get to? And this honestly, this applies to almost everything, at least I do in the classroom. Um, successful teaching is gonna show the why before we get to the what. So rather than focusing on, you know, here's all the different pieces you're gonna play with and here's the, the, you know, the mechanics of it, which could immediately overwhelm somebody who's new to all of that. We start with like, what are you trying to get to? What are you trying to accomplish? Um, it might be as simple as get more points than everybody else, right? If that's what you know everybody will respond to, then that's what we're gonna speak to. Uh, but it needs to be clear and direct uh, and in context of the theme whenever possible, right? So part of this is identifying your players. So if, if we're starting at the end, we need to, if, before we can even start at the end, go all the way back to the beginning and who's actually there? What do they care about? What are they gonna respond to? Um, so, do they want a little bit of conflict? Do they want to win the game? Do they want to learn, lean towards the strategic decisions? Um, are they new to gaming in general? They don't care about any of that stuff. Um, have they played similar games before? So do you have like a shortcut, shorthand? Like you can say, this is a drafting game, instead of saying, here's what a drafting game is. Um, so, I don't know about you guys, this is 
often the thing I think, at least when somebody's teaching me a game that somebody will often skim over, this has become super important to me now, especially using this in the classroom, um, to make sure I know who these people are before I try to teach them anything. Yeah, tabletop games are all about the players and about their experiences, and the game is there to facilitate new experiences and help them make interesting choices. But before you can get into how they can make those choices and the experiences that they might have, as you said, you have to first identify the gamers that, that are gaming and whatever their needs or desires or especially their expectations might be. Because as we all know, when you go into with you know false or misleading expectations, you're not going to enjoy the experience as much. So you really want to set the stage and the context for what they're going to be entering. And again, what they're entering hopefully is reflective of who they are and what kind of experiences they want to have. Yeah, absolutely. And I will say one of the things that I think is really important here is that everybody wants to get different things out of gaming, yes. right? So it would be really hard for you to explain the same game to seven different people or something in exactly the same way and hit all the high points, mm -hmm. which I think is important to know because like, we're not trying to teach you to do that here necessarily, right? But how much can you increase your probability of landing your teach in a way that's going to make sense for the maximum amount of people. Uh, maybe in an ideal world, you're going to be able to talk to everybody one-on-one -on -one sure. or something right. asynchronously. Um, that sometimes works on my end when you're teaching like an RPG or something uh, because we're screening people as part of the process. Um, but here, you know, it's it might be what is the most high value shot that you can take in terms of teaching, right? Like what strategy works for this group of people and, you know, can you supplement it with maybe some other stuff that you know from these people perhaps? Yeah. Yeah, and it's, it's one of those things that I feel like becomes a little more intuitive with time, but even just the act of recognizing what people want from you mm. initially, you internalize some of that, right? You're like, okay, I got six people playing this game, four of them have never played anything remotely close to this before. Mm -hmm. That's the lowest common denominator for this particular teach. Let's start from the beginning. That guy does know everything, it's fine, <laughs> right? <laughs> They're just going to have to, you know, hear the rules again. Um, Whereas on the, on the flip side, you have one person who's new. Maybe you don't delve that much in depth, but you give them a little more hands-on time as you get started with the game. Absolutely. All right. So, again, when we're talking about who's playing, we've got, you know, in the case of Seven Wonders, it can be anything. You've sure. got seasoned veterans who've played this game dozens of times. It's very short. Um, so it, you could have played it hundreds of times. You could play it online hundreds of times. Um, a complete newbie who's never heard of it which often happens, especially because it is an accessible time length and complexity. Um, so if you're looking for a game that's welcoming to newbies, this might be one that hits the table. Uh, someone's partner who came with them to game nights. <laughs> They're iffy on games in general. Um, a teenager tagging along, anybody's kids, uh, game night newcomers. Like, There's all these different dynamics, and we're all kind of familiar with what those look like. In a game like Seven Wonders, they all directly influence how somebody will engage with this experience. Because it's easy to say, this is quick, it's simple, it's fine, you'll see how it goes, but there's so much on the table, right? Like, mm -hmm. that is a lot of stuff <laughs> on the table. Even if if you know the game, you look at that, you're like, well, it's not that complicated. If you've never seen this before, you're like, what the actual heck, right? Yeah. And the ga games are collaborative, of course, whether they're competitive or cooperative, and those people at the table playing the game they create a certain, as you mentioned, a certain dynamic, a certain shape, a certain gestalt, and that's going to lead play. Mm -hmm. So helping, helping your, not just yourself identify what's happening, but the players around you. New, like as you mentioned, you have some veterans, they're looking to score points, you have a newbie who's new at the table, you want to let people know there is a new player, they might need some additional time. And these are the expectations from the game. It's, it's a learning game, we're going to have fun, or this is a competition, a tournament, we're going to win points here. Because, again, setting the expectations and knowing the players is essential. Yeah, absolutely. The only thing I was thinking other than that is, uh, yeah, the impression of the thing and, like, mm -hmm. setting the sort of standard of where you're going to be. Sure. Because I will say, like, as a tabletop gamer, like, if you go to too many mechanics and you're talking about too much interesting stuff, like, it slides off the top of my brain, I'm out. Like, I can't understand past a certain point, right? And it's going to take me a really long time to get in there. And, like, you roll up, and it's, you know, look at all this stuff on the table. There are some people who are going to be turned off by that, and so you kind of have to build over time into yeah. it. And, and, part, and a yeah. large part of that, too, is as the gamer's game, even if they're a new yeah. gamer, 
they're going to be they're going to level up, grow up, develop, yeah. and be you know different. I get it now. I yeah. see, I see it. So there goes from that newbie to that intermediate player who's now making strategic decisions and shifting the game to certain areas. You know, so a lot of that takes place throughout the game. So you have to stay very present to the gamers at the table. Yeah. Yeah. And that teach, I think, is really important to set up that moment, right? Because you want people to arrive that for themselves, to find the point where they're like, wow, I really am enjoying this. I'm really in what works for me. But you still have to teach them to play the game. Right. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and see, it's it's a matter of, like, how much can I tell this person, yeah. like, any of these people, um, before they check out? Like you said, if they, once they check out, it's really hard to get them back. Yep. Yeah. And if you're teaching a game, I find this helpful. But, again, it's not for everybody. But providing either if you're playing the game or if you're outside the game teaching, providing some commentary. Great move. Look what they did there. Like giving them sense that they are succeeding. They're moving forward in the game. They made some good plays. They're challenging. Or, hey, look out. So-and-so is, is in this kind of position right now to let the newbies know what they should be thinking about. So guiding their progress, too, is essential. Absolutely. So once you kind of know who's going to play your game, mm -hmm. right? Like who, who are we dealing with and what are their expectations? Let's think about the goals of the game. Sure. So we go back to the end. Um, what is the end, pain, end point goal of the game? Um, there's a few different ways we can ask this question because mm -hmm. it depends on what the nature of the experience is, right? One, how do you win? Yes. Is it a game you can win? If it is, how do you win? Um, a lot of people care about that. <laughs> uh, two, what does the end game look like? Yes. If it's really complex, it might be hard to show them that, but give them a sense of, here's what you're going to be doing at the end, and here's why it's important. Uh, what's the thematic point? Like, a lot of us, especially if we're more like numbers and figures oriented, mm -hmm. might skip over this part and be like, this mechanic and this mechanic and these points here. <laughs> um, but most people need something to anchor that to, right? Sure. What exactly are we doing? Oh, you're building a civilization. Okay. Now I can frame things with that. It's yes. easier to remember them. They slot into places in my brain. Um, and what's familiar about the end? This is where you come back to, like, what are games they've played before? What are experiences they've had, right? In my classroom, frequently, I do a survey at the beginning of every term, frequently the most common game people have played recently is Monopoly. So I know that there are no frameworks here um, to work with, other than, like, you can win, here's how you win, now everything else is new, right? Yeah. So I, I know, what types of questions do you guys have to think through in terms of, like, goals of the game when you're teaching? Well, I, I mean, there's a lot of dynamics that come into play, and I think that the goal here is to set, again, the expectations for the players at the table. As you mentioned, the goals of the game are not necessarily what's in the rule book. It's a victory point game. Excellent. But that may not be the goal of the game. Maybe the goal of the game is learning. Right. Maybe the goal of the game is collaboration, team building. Maybe the goal of the game is just to have fun. Mm -hmm. It's a learning game. Or again, maybe the game is a tournament game and you really have to go after each other in that particular game. So the goal of the game is what you bring to the table as the person bringing the game to the table, as the person teaching the game at the table. And, you know, some of that is work either in collaboration or in competition with the actual rule book, who typically may mention at the very beginning, it's a victory point game. Now let's show you all the things that do not matter. And then at the very end, that's the goal of the game. And you're like, but as Anthony said, I have to know where to put those things. So right. if the goal of the game is to have fun, now I change my expectations. Now I change my, my play style. So that's very different. Right. Or if the game is all about points and I do want to be successful in the game, then I can kind of gear myself differently. Yeah, absolutely. One of the things I think about too is sort of like what type of gamers are you dealing with and not necessarily in like what kind of games do they like, but like how are they oriented to the gaming space, mm -hmm. right? Like, because for me, I don't really care if I win at the end a lot of the time, right? right. But I want to be in it. I want to feel immersed. I want to have a good time. And so like if the thing is kind of contentious, I might not have a good time in a really intense kind of a game. And so then you can kind of frame that in like, okay, Everybody might have different goals for this. Maybe you're just here to have a good time or find a better strategy or to to increase your understanding of a thing. Like you, you'll leave this space knowing how to play one more game is a totally valid goal for somebody. And I think sometimes that can get lost on us of like, here's how you win the game, here's how you get points. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of times your teach is gonna be focused totally different than that. 
the points just end up mattering at the end right, for sure. some of the people at the table. And again, the, the goals frame everything else. Yeah, yeah. So that's essential to know because your teach will be different based upon either your goals or the goals of the game. Right. All right. So for Seven Wonders, again, we're going to keep with our framework here. The goal is to have the most points, right? If sure. you're talking about like the victory condition. But what does that actually mean? I think is the most important thing. And I've, I've been taught this game several times over the years, whether I've forgotten it or there's new versions or whatever. And I feel like nine times out of ten, the teach for this game goes, all right, so the goal is to get the most points. Um, here's what all the cards are, and here's how each of them scores points. And at which point I'm like, what are the cards? What do they represent? What are they doing? Those are the types of questions people are going to have. Um, so how do we break that down in a way that makes sense for people? Mm -hmm. um, for Seven Wonders in particular, it really is about theme, right? Sure, Absolutely. And it's about the idea that you can dwell within the civilization that you're building and that there are aspects and actions to the game that help you dwell in that civilization building, in that time, in that place. And again, depending on what you're looking for, the points are not consequential. Or maybe they are everything and you have to think about how you can kind of meta the game. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, like points are important. That's how you're going to win. I like points. Points are great. Yeah, but if somebody first time playing a game, they're like, I don't really care. I just don't want to do bad. Sure. <laughs> I want to come, not come in last. Yeah. And, and a lot yeah. of games, too. We talked about goals, because goals are going to frame everything else that comes. Sometimes, I, you know, even if I'm not winning the game, I'd like to see my strategy play out. Right. So, again, when we're talking about Seven Wonders, maybe I'm going science. Maybe I found a lot of green cards, and the idea that my civilization has all this scientific innovation to it is just fascinating. Do I win? I don't know, because we, have to, we haven't gotten to the end of the game yet. But right. at least as I'm playing the game, I'm reflective of the goals in mind, which is, like you said, it could be points, it could be fun, it could be making interesting decisions. What do I take here? Which cards do I take to score points that are more fun and interesting for me? And we all make those choices throughout every game that we play. Right. All right. So... This is where we get to like game systems, if we're going to try to explain to people, okay, you want to have fun, you want to get to know the game, you want to whatever. How do you actually get there? Mm -hmm. right? So this is where we actually talk about the rules. <laughs> this is like 90% of most people's teaches, and this is probably, honestly, like the, the, we're not talking about the most complex games in the world here. Sure. If you were, obviously the rules are very important. But for more simple games, people you're trying to get into things, students, patients, yes. whatever, it's really give them as much as they need to know to do what they've told you they want to do. Yeah. Right? Yep. And you want to be able to provide a thematic experience so that more games, 90% of games, do thematically play out, right. even if they're abstract. Mm. So if I have a framework, if I have buckets, and now Anthony's explaining me, to me the rules and specific actions and techniques, I know where that goes, and I know how it fits, fits within a context. Again, more times than not, unfortunately, you have to fight the rule book. Because right. the rule book doesn't teach you that that way. Right. Quite the opposite. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so, like, again, Seven Wonders, like, you talk about systems, you're like, oh, it's simple, right? There's, like, seven types of cards, here's what they do. But this is what a new player sees. They're like, <laughs> oh, okay, that's a lot of data yes. to try to process in my brain right now. Um, and so anytime we're teaching any game, no matter how simple we think it is, this is often what a new gamer sees or thinks. And they're yes. like, I don't know how I'm going to process this. And you're like, this is, like, the simplest game in the world. <laughs> sure. Why can't you figure this one out? Um, and then for us as teachers, like, how do I boil this down to the point that it makes sense to you? It's like, well, don't show them this. That's step one. Yeah. Um, just give them the information they need to succeed, right? And give it in a context, right? Like, we right now are part of a civilization that is utilizing culture and technology and resources and military. And we don't know what the next generation, the next age, in Seven Wonders speak, mm -hmm. will be able to do. But based upon what we do in age one, age two will benefit off of that. So you'll make decisions now without knowing what the future might bring to you, but you're moving towards a path without knowing exactly what that path may be. Yeah, and part of that setting expectations of, you know what, you're playing it for the first time, you're not going to fully see the big picture. It's not possible. Sure. Like, you can't wrap all of this in your brain, and that's fine, but here's the things you need to know in round one. Now here's the things you need to know in round two. Sure. Like, you don't need to show people guild cards before they've ever played the game and before they have any understanding of what a drafting game is. They should know that there's some powerful card at the end of the game maybe that matters, just in case they see a purple and they're like, what is this? 
Um, <laughs> but we wait and we show that to them before we start at round three. Yeah, and part of that is what we know to be cognitive load, right, right Anthony? Mm -hmm. Like, there's only so much one person's brain can carry from point to point. So what you want to be able to do is build scaffolding, right? Mm -hmm. This concept builds off this concept, so forth and so on. Seven of Wonders is perfect game for that. And you want to be able to do that with the teach. Mm -hmm. This is the basic concept. You're building the civilization. What does a civilization need? It needs resources. What else does it need? Well, once it has the resources, maybe people want to take those resources. I need military. Makes sense. But, you know, as my civilization grows, it's going to have culture. I definitely need culture in there. So you can explain the game in such a way that's thematic and fits the rule set at the same time. Right. They're not mutually exclusive. Yeah. So... I know we mentioned earlier like you do use a lot of tabletop RPGs. Well, yep. like, and we're mostly talking about board games here, but this applies to all games, right? Yeah, absolutely. And I think honestly, almost equally applies. Um, tabletop RPGs, especially, are kind of funny because a lot of the times they have different interlocking systemic mechanics. So, like, really what you're trying to do is, like, what's the minimum I can give this person to get them started? Mm -hmm. And, like, genuinely, like, I teach people, people to play Dungeons and Dragons probably at least a couple times a week at this point. And, like, I've got it down to, like, okay, you roll a die and then you add or minus a number. That's it. That's the game. And they're like, well, there's other stuff. Like, yeah, there's a lot of other stuff. Yeah. <laughs> but, like, we'll get there, right? Yeah. Uh, because all you need to know to get started is, like, which number am I looking at and which die do I roll? And it's that kind of thing of, like, you want to layer it in complexity so they're engaged and right. interested, but then when they're looking for that next thing, then the, the part that you're teaching is there for them. Um, or, you know, they can watch an, enough of it happen so you aren't overtly teaching the whole game up front unless the game really specifically requires that. Yeah, and there are always situations where it does. Yeah, there are some games that where you're like, you really got to understand this stuff. Maybe you won't remember everything I'm saying, but you've got to understand these, these concepts, otherwise the game's going to be difficult. Yep. But like, yeah, like D&D, &D, you're not going to throw the, the player handbook at them and say, read this and show up on Tuesday. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> that would be bad for everybody. Uh, all right, so breaking it down, we kind of already started this a little bit, but when you have systems in a game, when you have any kind of rule set, there are going to be questions, there's going to be concerns, and especially if you decide to leave some information out, mm. people are going to be like, what about this, and what about this, and what about this? So you need to have a system in place, a script, something in your brain of like, what information am I going to provide? What information am I not going to provide? And why? Because if you just say, well, don't worry about that right now. We'll get back to it. That could cause some tension, right? So when we're looking at Seven Wonders, that first round, you just really need to show them this, these basic concepts of like, well, here's resources. Here's what they're for. Here's how you get points. There are three ways you get points, right? Give a basic sense of that. Sure. Here's this military concept. It's only important for the people next to you. You're just keeping track of that information. And maybe you introduce science, right? But you don't need to go through like, okay, if you build this blue card, then this blue card can build on top of that for free. And this can build from here. And these are the guild cards you're going to have later. And these are the yellow cards and the merchant things and all the things you can do with that. And here's how you start hate drafting and <laughs> knock people out. Sure. Um, it's really just like, what are the core building blocks here? And then when they have those questions, you're like, oh, okay, that's a good question. Well, we're going to see that when we get to area two. Yeah, it's, 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 very, it's essential that you teach the game mechanics. That's more important than anything else. Because if they learn how to draft cards in a game, mm -hmm. that worked with so many other games. Mm -hmm. And they can carry that in a number of different places. So when I you know, work with students, whether it's you know, the younger students or the older students in the college and universities, the idea of drafting cards is applicable to so many other things in their lives. Like, you have to make choices without knowing necessarily how beneficial that choice might be, but you need to make choices from the options that are available to you. Deeply tactical. Yes. So you're going to get the cards in your hand, you're going to make a choice, knowing that you're giving that to your opponents, and knowing that you're going to receive something else that might benefit you or you know chain with something else. Conceptually, that's important for them to understand, as far as brown, red, blue, and green, that's something that comes along a little bit later. Right. Yeah. We, you just want them to feel comfortable holding those hand, cards in their hand mm -hmm. and being able to start making decisions. If you dump so much information on them that they're like, I don't know where to start with this, then the teach has failed. Yes. Even if you've taught every single rule, and even if five out of the six people at the table are like, I think I get it, and the one person's like, literally no idea what I'm doing. <laughs> sure. um, and that's the tough place to be, because you're like, I told you everything. I thought I did a good job. Mm -hmm. uh, 
but you just, we need to build it in such a way that everybody can engage with the material. And I know that's challenging, especially for like RPGs. RPGs seem very simple on the surface. They have a basic structure. People have seen them. There's, there's a number of books. The DM, GM's going to take you through it. And yet at the same time, I don't know all the actions I can take. I don't know. Right. <laughs> and that's one of the challenges that come in. So it seems overwhelming. So if you can kind of shrink the picture down a little bit and give me the possibilities or help mm -hmm. me figure out what the possibilities might be, that's going to help me make better choices. Yeah, absolutely. And I think the emphasis on possibilities is really important because you want players engaged, curious, thinking about what the possibilities are, mm -hmm. and then how the mechanics can get them there. Yes. Right. The last thing you want is them like sitting there Googling like what all the things you can do are. Because like <laughs> you don't need to do that. And like in transparency, I've been running I've been GMing and teaching games for ten or fifteen years at this point and like I don't know all the rules. Yeah. Because it's not important to in a lot of the situations. Like if there's an edge case that you need to learn, sure, look fine, it yeah. look it up, <laughs> right? Go combing through the rule book and find the page that says that. But other than that, like most of the time, most of the situations, it's just like, how does this kind of work? How can they wrap their brain around it? And how can it be interesting for whatever they want to do? And as you go through the actions and dynamics, whether yeah. it's an RPG or a tabletop game, from time to time, like you said, you're not going to either know all the rules or all the possibilities, or sometimes people are going to make mistakes and it's too far to go back. Yep. I often say, well, this game is a variant, right? Yeah. Like, we're just playing a different version of the game. You played that card. You made that action. Yeah. We're going to go ahead with it. We're going to enjoy the process because you don't want to slow their roll, you know? Yeah. You want them to continue on progressing and moving ahead and not kind of dwell upon the fact that I made a bad choice, so therefore we have to start the game all over yeah. or redo that particular scenario situation. We just play on. Right, yeah. What is the outcome you want to have right now? Yes. Okay, well, let's look at what's available to you to get there. Not, like, let's evaluate every possible rule to see what you can do. Yeah. You don't need to min-max this game the first time you're playing it. Um, and some people will want to do that, and I don't discourage it in the classroom necessarily. What I do do is put some amount of constraint around that, of, like, sure. we have an hour and 20 minutes. You need to take your turn in a reasonable amount of time. Yes. This is the structure in which we're going to do that. And that's not something I necessarily can, like, tell you all how I do, because I let the students decide on their own, like, what is the structure you want to have for how you manage time? Sure. Do you want to have a sand timer? I have a handful of sand timers I come into class with. Do you want to set a stopwatch? Do you just want to say, please hurry up? Do you not care if you don't finish the game? Some students don't care. Um, but having some system in place, and that doesn't necessarily just apply to the classroom. That can apply anywhere. Mm -hmm. Like, you just don't want anybody to get bogged down so much. And like, I have to figure this out. I have to solve it. Like, no, just focus on what you want to get out of this, and let's just get to that point. And I think there's a general feeling just in life in general society where you can rules are are, are connoted to a, a something being wrong right if there's rules right. there's something that can be wrong there could be something that's broken i could be wrong i could be bad i could make it's all bad right right right, right. but ironically tabletop games role play games especially yeah. The fun is the rules. Yeah. The fun is the constrictions and the opportunities and limitations. I know sometimes we reviewed some board games on the Board Gamers Anonymous where I know some of your favorite games are the games that are very restrictive. Yeah. Because you have to come up with ingenious solutions. Or again, depending on what the DM puts together, how do I get out of this? It seems impossible. There's the fun. Rules are there for fun. And I think especially working with younger gamers who are, are afraid that they're gonna get yelled at, that they did something wrong, this is an opportunity to teach them that rules and structures and boundaries are to their benefit and are fun. Yeah. All right, so all of those pieces, right? The end goal, the people playing the game, what they wanna get out of it, the mechanics that we have there, they all kind of lead us to put together a storyline of sorts, right? What's the path the players are going to take to achieve the goal with the actions described? Um, and it, the, what this looks like will depend ultimately on how much you decided to share with them, who they are, what they need out of this. But what is the story of the game, the path they're going to follow, mm -hmm. the, the narrative that they're going to build collectively? And this doesn't just apply to RPGs. This applies to any game, mm -hmm. right? We're completing a system together. Like you said, all games are cooperative to a degree. Yes. The game does not exist until we all sit down to play it. So what is it going to look like? Mm -hmm. What are we going to do with that, right? I asked my students to sit down and write this up for me. Like, what was sure. the narrative, right? And so after they've done that once or twice, when I 
start teaching the games or they start teaching each other, this makes more sense. Like, what is the flow? Where are we going? How are we going to get there? Um, and it sounds kind of wishy-washy, but at the same time, thinking in that framework has mm -hmm. really, really helped me in terms of how are we going to go from point A to point B? How much time do we have to get there? And what do I want them to get out of that? Um, yes. And it, to some degree, teach, tells me what games can I bring in, right? Yeah. I know I have 10 minutes to teach a game at the start of class, so I need to make sure there's a game where I can present the end goals and the victory conditions and the mechanics mm -hmm. and what the players need and this storyline in 10 minutes, Sure. right? Not just list off the rules in 10 minutes, because a lot of games you can do that with. Um, and this is about being descriptive. It's about being fun. It's about showing them what it looks like on the table, like putting the cards out, demonstrating the actions, walking through the flow of the game. Um, being as visual and kinetic as possible, mm -hmm. I think, is, is really important here. Absolutely. It's, we think we sit down at the table and then we do nothing. But we're actually very physically involved. This phenomenological kind of experience of the table, of the pieces, of the cards, all of these different components and the board and everything that's around me and everything that I'm manipulating is part of me. Because mm -hmm. now my experience of the game has, I've left my body a little bit and now I'm part of the game. Just like when you drive a car, you're part of the car. You, f you, you feel the presence and the size of the car as you drive it, but you're just sitting down. And the same thing's true when you're playing a game. You bleed into the game, you bleed into the experience, you become part of that story, and you're making choices along the way. And whether it's a tabletop game or an RPG, that's so much part of the experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I think that's one of the important parts about as you kind of point out, when you're teaching it to somebody with a purpose, yes, and you know, even just playing the game is a purpose, right? But like, how quickly can people grasp things? How can you get them to the part that's making sense? Yeah. How can you start telling the story together? Um, and you know, that's, I mean, I teach RPGs, and so a lot of the time it's just like, here is the very fundamental tenets that you need for this, and then I'm going to put you in a situation where you're using them. Yes. So they understand how to use it, they vaguely understand what they're doing, and then they're likely to have a more fun experience, which then allows you to build the other things. Like, oh, can we do this? Yes. Somewhere. And, and one works. of the things that we've been talking about was cognitive load, about how oh, much yeah. can you mentally carry. Yeah. But another important aspect is obviously the anxiety of playing a game. Mm. Oh, yeah. The anxiety of making choices that will be deterministic in the experience. And again, just like the rules, this is fun. Yeah. It's fun to be anxious about what decision I'm going to make and how it's going to come out. Or if I'm playing a very complex Euro game and I'm making a decision in like the first two rounds, it's going to affect me three hours later. Mm -hmm. And it's, the anxiety is delicious. It's wonderful. But as, as somebody teaching the game, we have to help them manage the anxiety so it's more like a roller coaster instead of, you know. Jumping on the cliff. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I was going to say, you want anxiety as in I'm anticipating yes. or I'm worrying about good strategy or how is my civilization going to look at the end of this? You don't want like, oh God, what if I mess this up? What if my everyone hates me at the end of this? Right. You know, because that's, no one is going to have a good time. And again, that goes back game. to setting the rules, setting the, mm -hmm. setting the goals, oh, yeah. setting the expectations and knowing your gamers. So that's yeah, why yeah. that stuff comes first before you have to make any kind of actions whatsoever. Oh yeah, when I think one of the things of teaching too is like the, our hobby is vast and diverse. Mm -hmm. There are many times where I've played game, gotten through all of it, great, I never wanna play that game again. That's true. Because <laughs> I don't like it, it's not my game, right? Yeah, yeah. But, that's fun, but I still had a good time. Sure. I enjoyed the shared experience that we had, it's just also not for me, or like it would have to be a very specific context for me to play that game again. Yeah. And none of those things are bad, it's just, Okay. Well, that's true. I mean, for 20 plus years, I was, I've been a director of different career <laughs> development centers at different colleges and universities. So typically what we do is internships because we want to give experiential education. So sometimes students go to an internship and they go, I don't like it. Great. So now that's you know great. something about yourself and you don't have to return to that type of experience. It's not for you. It's not who you are. If you like it, that's also great. Yeah. They're equally great. So yeah. making choices and learning what games work for you is, oh, yeah. is amazing. Well, especially the one of the nice parts about the gaming ecosystem is that there are so many games mm -hmm. and there's so much overlap and so much yes. differentiation. So you can play this game and you're like, this is a lot. Yes. But like, I remember we played uh, Point City. Yes. At Gen Con. And I was like, okay, I don't normally like drafting games. Yes. I don't like the tableau. I don't like all the complication. It makes me feel weird. But like, we played that and I was like, oh, okay. This is more my speed. I could get into it. I could feel it. 
and then that tells me like I can like this kind of game. Mm -hmm. Maybe I'm not gonna like this version of this, but I I know how to grasp on to this kind of thing. And if you play a game and you're like, it was kind of there but not quite, mm -hmm. great. Then there's probably a dozen other games that are somewhat similar in style or substance that maybe works for you. And I think essentially what Anthony's talking about, we were talking about the story the storyline here is oftentimes like you go out to see the movies with, with a friend yeah. and I'll say, Did you like the movie? And you'll say, Yeah. I was like, Yeah, I like the movie too. But then we don't have any further discussions yeah. about why we like the movie. Maybe you like the acting. I hated the acting. <laughs> but I love the directing. You hated the directing. And the same thing about creating the storyline here and being reflective mm -hmm. and helping the, the gamers be reflective because they'll learn more about themselves and what games they like to play in the future. Yeah. Yeah. There we go. Hmm. Um, so, yeah, the, the game narration, I think we've, and we've been talking about this, right? So it's the, the main thing here to get to all of that, to how to get to that point is please don't use the rule book. <laughs> I mean, Rarely. Again, and there's always caveats. You get a big heavy game, it's a 40 page rule book. You probably need to reference it to make sure yes. you're not forgetting stuff. Yeah. But like, you should know the game well enough and be comfortable enough teaching it not to have to read it to people. Yes. Mm -hmm. I had a friend for the longest time and very, very smart, knew a lot of games, but whenever we'd come over and they'd teach a new game, he'd pull out the rule book and just like go through point by point. And I could not learn the rules that yeah. way. Right, I just—that's not how my brain works. Um, like, you, I could just read it myself. <laughs> uh, so, you—you got to get them into the narration. You got to help them feel it. Walk them through the actions, initial steps, and turns, and build it with them. Mm -hmm. Like, it's—it's it's a cooperative experience. Um, don't just throw a bunch of rules and walk away. I mean, like, you guys are good. You figure it out. We're good. Um, be nearby. Ideally, you're playing with them. But if that's not possible, then you know, be nearby for when those questions pop up. The one thing I've noticed, especially dealing with students, is they won't always ask questions. Yes. Mm -hmm. They'll start playing the game, and you can kind of sense in the direction. They're <laughs> like, well, I don't, but he said, I don't know. <laughs> and none of them want to raise their hand or come over sure. and ask. And so then I have to, if I'm not paying attention, if I'm over grading papers, then I don't know that they don't know what they're doing, right? And then all of a sudden, nobody's having a good time. Yeah. Um, so a big part of that is just being aware, being present, being engaged, and understanding where they're at in that narrative. Because mm -hmm. the narrative doesn't stop once you finish the rules. It's the whole game. Yes. All right. Um, and so, yeah, we get back to the Seven Wonders, we, how we guide that narrative. It's a story of a civilization, the path it takes, and the consequences of those decisions, mm -hmm. right? Um, when they understand that goal, how they can achieve the goals that they have set personally and the mm -hmm. barriers that are in the way, the basics start to make a little more sense, right? So like, I don't show the students or anybody really when I teach this game, like the civilization boards until after we've gone through everything else. Mm -hmm. Because the civilization board doesn't really mean anything. Mm -hmm. It's a cool decision to make. They're like, oh cool, I wanna do pyramids. But you don't actually know what the wonders on that board mean until everything else is in place. Sure. Like, what civilization do you want to build? Do you want to be more militaristic? Do you want to be more science-based? Do you want to have some flexibility? Do you want to get more cards? Those are decisions that they're not going to actually understand that they're making. And then later, they're like, oh, I don't like this. <laughs> right? <laughs> um, so we want to give them that information first, help them walk through it. Drafting is a game mechanic. One of the last things I teach, I, I explain to them you're going to be interacting with each other through the cards, but we don't get to what that means until we have the basics in place. Mm -hmm. um, and with prerequisites for building things, right? Like. If you're trying to build this, you need to have built this or pay this person, right? That's stuff that doesn't really make sense until you have the whole picture in front of you. Mm. Absolutely. And, I, and also, too, at times when teaching games, I think, as you mentioned, your job is to learn the rule book, consume the rule book, and be able to provide a new rule book, a living rule book that can guide them through the process. Some of that's also, and Seven Wonders is a really good example of this, expansions. Seven Wonders leaders gives students or any gamer at the table an opportunity to kind of initially guide their progress. So maybe for the gamers at the table, that might be something you want to include. Or again, maybe it's a com on concept that's too much for them at that time for that cognitive load. So it's something that you add later. So again, but that comes from your playing, your teaching, your knowing the group, your setting the goals and expectations, and then teaching the mechanics to see if that's something that you can apply to the particular game and if it's beneficial for the people at the table. Yeah, absolutely. All right, so the, the, the thing about teaching is that you have to get out and do it, mm -hmm. right? It's not, 
it's not so much like a, it's not an intellectual exercise. You can't write. A, I mean, I have scripts that I use <laughs> as notes. Um, just be like, this is what's worked with the students. But at the end of the day, it really depends on your group, right? You have to get out. You have to try it. You have to probably make mistakes. Sure. You have to fail. So it's it's never going to be like this is the way you teach this game because there is no one way to teach any one game. Mm -hmm. um, which is why using the rule book by itself is often not the best way to get there. Um, one of the things that I often do, and it works in the classroom because I can tell them to do it and they have to do it, um, <laughs> is I have people kind of freshen up on the rules beforehand so they can kind of come in with their own questions and perspectives. Sure. So like, here's a video that I like, or I make my own video, or I give them like, you know, an abridged rule book or, or guidelines. But then we still go through it in class. We still go over it, right? Just have some, some level of inf you know, information to come in with. And it still gives you that sense of narrative when you do that. Absolutely. All right, so I believe that's us. Absolutely. Right? So um, we do a lot of stuff. Uh, we <laughs> mentioned at the beginning, uh, BGA, we have Board Gamers Anonymous, we mentioned is our podcast. So that is, uh, we've been 10 and a half years now we've been doing that. Yes, sir. So uh, releases every week, and uh, we talk about new games, we talk about uh, games we've been playing, we talk about lots of interesting features and, and things coming up. We just did our annual board game bracket um, where we took 64 games from non-IP based themes mm -hmm. and we picked the best theme. Um, it wasn't cats. No, it wasn't. Sorry. And again, uh, I think oftentimes as teachers we want to learn to teach but also by teaching we learn the games better. So we've been doing a podcast for 10 plus years so we're constantly talking about the games so that helps our teachers. Yeah. So I think it's also important to tell other people whether it's on a podcast or friends or family, you need to involve them in your kind of experience to see what really kind of susses its way out. And one of the ways you could do that is by listening to a podcast where you yeah. talk about that all the time and how that kind of fits in or does it fit within a particular group or such. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, and to that end, we have Board Game Academics, yes. which um, this is our... Uh, Academic journal, which we, we actually launched last year, like right before we were here. Yes. And we completed the journal, and it is now available. You can see issue one is up on the website um, as of March 1st. So if you want to read those, some amazing articles in there. With some really great opportunities and lessons about how to teach games. Yeah, yeah, several actually, specifically about getting a game into the classroom, how to teach it, how to use it. Um, Especially with a number of different populations that yeah. might be more challenged or not may not be as represented or underserved by the tabletop industry, that's essential. Um, neurodiversity across the board about how to help people get into gaming and to enjoy that kind of experience. So check that out. And again, every year there'll be a brand new issue. And it's that website has a lot of information um, and other videos and, and opportunities and articles how to teach more games. Yeah. All right. So that is us. Thank you. Anybody have any questions? A little bit of both. Um, early in the term, we all play roughly the same things. So I have like I use like an icebreaker game, um, just called Just One for everybody. Um, it's a good like just minimalized communication game that works across, you know, um, language and uh, cultural barriers. But then once we get into week two, like, I have class on Monday, they've chose games, I sent them their assignments on Thursday, um, or Friday. Uh, and so part of that is I want them to have agency, I don't want them to be stuck playing a game they don't want to play. So it's, it's harder for me, <laughs> it's more work for me, because I have to bring in all five games. I, I gotta make sure I'm refreshed on the rules, but I, I manage the library. So I send them a survey. I'm like, here are your eight choices for this week. Pick four options. I will match you up accordingly. That way I know I know the games. I don't need to refresh on the rules too much. You can learn the rules before you come to class on Monday, hopefully. <laughs> you know, um, And it keeps things relatively streamlined. It also helps them kind of determine what kind of games they like so they can go in the right directions. Go. Yeah. Sure. Um, teaching the teacher. Yeah. <laughs> and so, even playing solo games, you're teaching the teacher. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Um, what is your preferred method of learning games? Do you use online resources, reading 
So the same thing would be true with what we talked about the presentation is first know the gamer. Uh, I hate reading rule books. <laughs> just for some reason, I mean, I read endless numbers of books for school, but there's something about reading a book for me that just doesn't, I don't absorb it properly. So I'm a very visual learner. So I either need to watch a video or actually play with all the components out there on the table. I can't abstractly hold the game itself mm -hmm. in my head as I'm reading the rule book. So by knowing yourself and your best learning style that you've you know, employed in a number of different ways, I would say that's probably the first step to go. Yeah, whereas I, I always read the rule book. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. um, I, I learned very well from reading and I'd like to see how the designer has envisioned it. That said, I often follow it up with a video just to have some kind of visualization. And before I do anything, I'll always set the game up. So like if they're referencing something, I want to be able to look at it on the table and see this is what they're talking about moving this to here. Um, I can't quite abstract everything. So it's like a hybrid for me. And I think a lot of times game designers make logical leaps that they're able to make, but the average gamer may not see or experience mm. or contextualize. So as you said, when you set the game up, and typically I will run through the game multi-handed. I'm sure you've done that yeah, as yeah. well. Oh, yeah. So that you could see the pitfalls like, and now do this. Why? Yeah. <laughs> Why would I do this? And, and if you did that in, at the game time, it, it screeches everything to a halt. Every time. Yeah. So your experience of it could just kind of smooth things out a lot more. So at the very least, just play through it. Even if it's quickly, it's quick and messy, that's fine. But you got, you know, you got to see where things were going with the game. Yeah, I will say I do a lot of uh, watching videos and stuff. Um, especially watching a group play the game mm. really helps me because what tends to happen in those style of videos is like someone is responsible for teaching them the game. So things like, like tabletop or something where they're like, here's the game. Here's what the game is about. Okay, now we're going to play the game. And so you get both aspects of it. The part that I get the most value out of is watching other people ask questions about the game mm. because often... the you can't anticipate the questions your players are gonna ask you, which is important, but also the questions they ask tend to be things that are either grind spots in the rule book anyway, or things that are a little bit harder for maybe a newer player to understand. Um, like for example, uh, I ran the Dragon Age tabletop RPG for like years, I had run this game, and I watched uh, somebody play it on YouTube and they were like, yeah, this is how this system works. And I was like, wait, what? <laughs> I did not know that, sure. and it's I have played this game for like two years. It's a variant. Yeah, and I was like, uh-oh. <laughs> but it was like, oh, okay, that makes more sense. It's not intuitive the way it's written in the rules. The newer version of the rules makes it more intuitive, right? But like, okay, this is how other people at a table understand this and deal with it. That helps me a lot. And I think a lot of times, too, when we talked about the rules and, and trying to give the goals first, mm -hmm. and the goals are not always necessarily points yep. or who wins or king of the hill kind of stuff like that mm -hmm. by either going through the rule book or playing the game even quickly or with dummy hands is mm -hmm. what matters most to me is where in the game is the interesting decisions i love games that have interesting decisions it doesn't necessarily even have to be fun decisions it's just really dynamic interesting decisions so when you're playing seven wonders some of the interesting decisions are i'm i have these resources i have now an opportunity of a branching path Am I going to continue to, to gain more resources, more brown cards, or am I going to finally start to pivot mm -hmm. for victory points or something else that's going to score me, whether it's science, or am I going to hold off mm -hmm. and just go for guilds at the end of the game, now having all this money and resources? So when I talk to gamers and I'm trying to teach the game, I let them know that the goal of the game is that interesting decision that they make of when do I take my resources and engine, and then turn it on. If I turn it on too early, I can't produce anything. Yeah. If I turn it on too late, I'm not getting enough points. That's the interesting crux of Seven Wonders and many other games. Mm -hmm. But you don't know that until you, as a teacher, have played through it, because the game designer is not necessarily gonna see that. They might say, it has this mechanic, it has drafting, it has tableau building, great. But that's not the interesting decision. The interesting decision is when the human gets involved and has to go now. And that's yeah. just, that moment in the game is so rich and so just wonderful and anxiety producing <laughs> at the same time. Yeah. Just to see how that kind of works out. And the same thing with RPGs where you have to make that role that's gonna either save or lose your life. Yep. I, uh, I think a lot about too, uh, 
what are the edge cases of the game that you're playing? Um, because the people I play games with, uh, present company included, I guess, are like weirdos. Yeah. So like you play games <laughs> and you're like, they're going to ask me some ridiculous question that I don't have any access to. And it's like, okay, how, how would I interpret this in a way? And so I can like see it like, okay, yeah, that's a question you could reasonably ask. Because sure. like I remember I was playing something was from friends of mine from college and the guy like wasn't engaging with the mechanics in the correct way and he's like, I'm just going to hoard all the gold on the game. And I'm like, <laughs> that's an option. That is an option. Um, I don't think you're going to win, but like I couldn't, I, I don't think the designer would conceive of the fact that like he's playing a game with his wife who wants to win and yes. so he's just going to hoard all the resources and like troll her the entire time <laughs> with no attempt to actually win the game and I'm like, okay, that's a choice. Um, Again, know your players. Know your players, yeah. right? <laughs> and the other thing too is I think like what's your elevator pitch for the game, right? If you're yes. playing a game, what you like, like try to sell it and like some of my favorite games I try to sell all the time and nobody wants to play them because like either my pitch isn't good or it's not people's game, right? But how would you explain the game in the barest possible terms to get someone interested in playing it? And that's not going to hit all the populations, I don't think, but it can give you some insight into how you would talk about it. Because like one of my favorite games of all time is Gloom, right? And my elevator pitch for Gloom is it's a game where you make your family sad and kill them. And for some people, they're like, cool, that's horrifying. I will never play that game. And that's like, oh, okay, wrong audience, <laughs> right? Good, we're not going to play that game. But, you know, if you're in a different context where you might be like, it's a game where you tell stories about, like, really depressed families or something like that. Like, thinking about how you might talk to different people about it might also kind of guide how you would engage with it yourself. So know thyself, teacher. I think yeah. that's, yeah. that's, that's key. <laughs> don't do this. I've done a lot of failing forward in my I failed an awful lot with <laughs> things that I thought would be successful and then I succeeded with things that were like, really? That's what you're latching on to? So mm -hmm. I'm learning by process of elimination. But you have anything you would just like totally stay away from? It's okay to say no. <laughs> no, it definitely is. Um, I started with like Flipping rights and rolling rights, just so I can teach one game to the audience, just to mm. kind of see how they respond back to me. You know, and I, then I start with yeah, I think what we'll, we we'll just lead it off from like, know that teacher, right? Mm. So, what do you bring to the table? So, I used to have a, an old professor who used to say, check yourself before you walk in the door. What are you carrying with you? Mm. So, why do I want to teach you a roll and write, right? All my students here, I think this would be better beneficial. This would be educational for you. This is what I want for you. Mm. But first and foremost, again know what they want, what they're looking to engage for, what their experience and expectations allow for them to do. So sometimes it's cognitive load, sometimes it's the emotional characteristic of the game that may work or not in the case of Gloom. Um, and sometimes it's just, I wanna get my family to get something to the table, it would be great if you played the game that I really love to play. Uh, so oftentimes I think one of the things that I do that's been best but a little hard to do is take games that are, might be a little easier mm. so that they have some, it gives them some confidence. So we did a list on, on the podcast where we said that the new gateway games are actually children's games. Mm. And again, that's, I would never play a children's game. That would never be me. That's not for, you know, and I've, but I've played these children's games in higher ed and it's the idea that I can work out the mechanics and children's games have that context and that level of fun and low cognitive load so that I feel like now I'm entering the hobby, I have played a designer board game, whether it be children's or not. It, it's not necessarily defined as children's, right? Because the designer board games are genius. They have to be more genius because they're working with little kids. So animal upon animal, right? It's meant for kids, it's ages this and that. Adults play it, you know? Rhino Hero, that's another game that's great. And again, that would be something typically for children, but you could play with a number of people. And playing with a number of different groups helps your teach too. So playing with younger kids, older, adults, and so on, really is helpful. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think the, like the first time I taught my class, um, I, I made assumptions about difficulty and complexity that were based on being a gamer, not necessarily mm. being an instructor. Um, and so I went by like board game geek complexity and my feelings on complexity and what my kids could do. I was like, well, if my 10 year old can play this, <laughs> but that didn't really matter because it was about the cognitive load, right? Yeah. It was yeah. about 
doing that survey the first day of class and finding out, oh, 85% of you, the most complex thing you've ever played is Uno or Monopoly. Mm -hmm. So if I bring in a game with two mechanics that you don't know, it's too much. Yeah. Right? So it has to be one. Right? So King of Tokyo is a great example. That's a game that worked really well because it's Yahtzee. They get that. And then we're adding something to it. Whereas Pandemic, very difficult because it has a completely new system combined with multiple new mechanics. Despite the fact I could teach that game to pretty much anybody at this convention in five minutes, it's too complex for that population. Yeah. Yeah. A pandemic. Okay. Well, Hot Zone's great because it, it, it's That's a little it's boiled down. Yeah. 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 Um, Speaking about teachers, we have Game Master Dave, one of our teachers here. Dave, come on over. Okay, be careful. Dave is actually, Dave is our master game teacher here at Long Island <laughs> Tabletop Gaming Expo, teaching endless numbers of games to endless numbers of different people and making them have the best time ever. Well, I really appreciate that, Chris. Uh, you know, and I listen to your podcast and I snuck in a couple times to listen to what you guys were talking about. And I'm like, I, I, you guys are just so bright and so brilliant in this gaming stuff. Um, you know, I am humbled. So thank you very much for saying sure. so. Uh, but yes, uh, the passion of my life is teaching games. I absolutely love teaching games. And the main reason for it, I feel I love to get people together so that they can experience something different. Sure. You know, and with that is created, you know, memories and associations and friendships and uh, learning through that. Learning about other people, learning to communicate, learning the game system so that hopefully then those people go on to teach others and, you know, learn for, and, and go from there. Uh, and I've developed... And uh, I, I wish I was here for the whole podcast to listen to what you guys were talking about. For the little bit that I was here, I saw that you guys were talking about the exactly the same kind of strategies that I use, mm -hmm. which is I basically welcome the people to the table. Mm -hmm. I introduce myself. I talk about the general theme. I talk about how to win. Yes. I talk about... The systems that, like, okay, if you move this piece here, you gain a victory point. If you're able to do this, you do this. And then you mentioned in one of the times that I was here, I don't teach the entire game. to sit there for 30 minutes trying to teach the entire game. I just sort of say, okay, in the early part of the game, you want to get to this location on the board. Sure. And that's all I cover, the, the, the things to get there. And then, but I might have thrown in a few things to just let them know that eventually you want to get to this part of the board, yes. you know, and maybe I don't explain everything on how to do that just yet. I also sometimes caveat it at the beginning saying, just so you know, I'm not teaching you all the rules. So this first time we're playing, you might have made different choices if I did, mm -hmm. but I think that it's not conducive for fun if I sit here for 30 minutes teaching you all the rules right now, you know? So learn from this experience, and the second time you play, you'll you'll understand. And I think that's there. key, and, and that's uh, something with the teachers that we often forget because we're so ingrained within the hobby is fun. Yeah. Right? Teaching students at any age, college age, does not matter. It must be fun for them. Fun right. for them. Right, so if they're having fun, they're learning. If they're learning, they can play more games, feel right. more confident, less anxious about that. Right. And also, again, of course, learn from other teachers. Dave's a great teacher. I, I played a game with Dave, he taught me the game. I learned things about teaching right. from that. And I think that's something to pass on as well. Right, thank you. Uh, and, and so one of the just little side notes just out of how I got into this was when I was in probably, maybe not grade school, but at least junior high, my friends would get games for the holidays or, or whatever uh, for their birthdays, and they'd be like, this game is too complicated. Dave, can you read the rules and teach me how to play my game? <laughs> you know, And sure. I'd be like, sure. So for some reason, how I get my fun yes. is from teaching the game. Yes. You know? And it's because I run around to libraries, conventions, and, and all sorts of places to teach games all over Long Island 
many times I don't get a chance to play the games. I'm always teaching. Mm -hmm. So then, but I have built up a core net group, net, a network of friends that that like some heavy, serious games. And mm -hmm. so I get a chance. That's that's my additional entertainment. So I love teaching, but I also love playing those, you know, really uh, minutia games. And, and you're better at those games because you teach other games. Yes, and, I, and by the way, I am teaching those more difficult <laughs> games too. I, I basically am the teacher for all my friends, you know. But it's okay because I like it. Now some people, it's a skill set. Yes, it, it's, it's acquired skill set, but yes. it's also a personality skill set. That's not exactly the right way to put it. You guys would probably have a better way to put it. You well, know? also, I mean, I, I think for a lot of us, when we think teaching, it's this extroverted kind of hobby but at the same time, tabletop gaming is typically thought of as an introverted kind of hobby. Mm. By me taking a game, something that I love, and sharing it with you, it allows me to feel more comfortable with being more extroverted, right. and that shows. But at the same time, I can stay within my own safe space and feel comfortable because it's something I love and something I have fun with as right. well. Right, So, yeah. All right. Awesome. Well, thank you everybody for joining us. And again, follow us on Board Gamers Academics and BoardGamersAnonymous.com, our podcast, where we produce a weekly podcast and talk more about teaching games at the table. Thank you. Thank you. Dave, you deserve a medal for teaching hegemony. <laughs>